So have you thought up a jingle for Navy Federal yet? I am. I am really trying. Uh, maybe Reveille. Dun 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 dun. Have you ever tried to put words to that? Navy. When I was in boot camp, I did. Sure. In my head. In fact, in fact, taps. I don't remember exactly what it was, and there might actually be words for taps, but I don't know them. But I would just be thinking like six more weeks. You know, like like however much time there was left. Six more weeks. I finished another a, day. That's exactly right. Made it through. As long as they don't wake me up in the middle of the night. I've got Firewatch at 2 a.m. Yes. On behalf of Navy Federal Credit Union, the team here at Stacky Benjamins, thanks to everyone keeping us safe in the military. Thank you. Let's do a show, OG. Let's. And say we did. I mean, you're living in your mother's basement writing a blog on finance. Really, you should stay off the computer, son, and get a job. Seriously. Live from Joe's mom's basement, it's the Stacking Benjamin Show. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and hey, we're talking about introverts. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This is a finance podcast. Hold it, Steve. This is supposed to be a family podcast, man. We don't need to talk about those disgusting introverts. Oh, oh, uh, okay, Steve, uh, roll the tape. I guess I wore these leather pants for nothing. Because today, we're welcoming Matthew Owen Pollard to talk about introverts and networking. And let me tell you, this introverts thing is not what I thought it was about. If you're an introvert, which is definitely not at all perverted, the last thing you want is to schmooze in some Zoom meeting. So today, we'll share some tricks that'll make you the best networker in the room. Plus, isn't Bitcoin supposed to be uber secure? Well, today, during our headline segment, we'll tell you about how and why German police seized more than $60 million in Bitcoin and more. Also, we'll save some time to toss out the Haven Lifeline to Justin, who wants to know the difference between an IPO and a direct listing. And I'll top things off with some introvert-themed trivia. And now, two guys who are just a couple of disgusting introverts, whatever that means. Okay, this script is really not working. It's Joe and O J J J J G. And we're rolling into Monday. What a Monday of an open when you realize it just ain't working. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Stacky Benjamin Show. I'm Joe Salci. Hi, Average Joe Money on Twitter. And across the card table, he's got the coffee, ready to brave another week. It's Mr. OG. It is Arctic here <laughs> in the basement today. So not only do I have the hot coffee, but I brought a thermos of coffee. Yes, because it's what, 42 degrees. And that's warm. Yeah, I mean, that's a warm 42. I mean, this was a day of literally uphill both ways walking to the basement in the snow. Yeah, yeah. I feel so so bad for you with this hugely Arctic Texas weather. I'm thinking about our friend uh, Tyson up in the Arctic Circle. You see his pictures on the Facebook page? No, because it's so dark all the time. (laughs) None of it comes out. He's like, look, another day. Look, a polar bear. It looks like nighttime. Right over there. Where? Uh, You can't see anything. It's hey, we got a great show today. We got Matthew Owen Pollard here. And if you're somebody that, like me, is an introvert, people are like, you're an introvert? It, abs- <laughs> absolutely. I don't know about Joe that. Joe needs his alone time. But if you're someone who's an introvert, you hate networking stuff, Matthew Owen Pollard's going to help us with all of that. He's a little bit excitable guy. Uh, really, really gets into what he does. And I can't wait. Having heard him talk before. I'm super excited. We've got some great headlines too, but first, you pay your credit cards off every month. Well, if so, you know that any credit card can offer cash back, but only discover 
matches all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year. It's like getting one of those birthday cards that's shaped like cash. So you already know there's cash inside before opening it. But in this case, it's stuffed with your first year cash back match and you don't even have to send a thank you now. Cash back match only by Discover. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Discover something brighter. All right, we got Matthew Owen Pollard waiting in the wings. But first, let's get to your headlines. Hello, darlings. And now it's time for your favorite part of the show, our stacking Benjamin's headlines. Our first headline comes to us from Reuters, written by John O'Donnell. Do you see this one? News out of Germany, OG. German prosecutors confiscated more than 50 million euros, which is $60 million worth of Bitcoin from a fraudster. Uh oh. I mean, it, it, I thought they weren't supposed to be able to find it. I thought it was the whole purpose of Bitcoin. Well, here's the deal. The man was sentenced to jail and has since served his term, maintaining his silence throughout. While police made repeated failed efforts to crack the code to access more than 1,700 Bitcoins because of the fact that he won't give them the password. So you think they're at the police station? They're like, hey, this dude's almost out of jail. Quick, we need to break the passcode. My password. Yes, sir, we need your password. The password that I use. Yes, sir, your password. There's been another breach. Sir. Right, okay. I-H-A-T-E-M-Y-J-O-B-1. I hate my job, one. Want to get away? Now you can with some. Did they try that? Would this guy's be I-H-A-T-E-J-A-I-L? Exactly one exclamation. (laughs) (laughs) So this was always part of the promise of cryptocurrency, right? It is uniquely yours. It can't be hacked. Well, except that the U.S. government just hacked one for a billion like a couple of months ago. Okay. It's difficult to hack. Yeah, true. But you are, you were very much in control. It's hard to see $60 million from a guy when he won't give you the password. True. I mean, I wish he wasn't a criminal. That make me feel better about Bitcoin. Uh, we asked him, but he didn't say. <laughs> Prosecutor Sebastian Murr told Reuters a couple weeks ago. Perhaps he doesn't know Bitcoin is stored on oh, software. Oh, he doesn't know. There you go. No. <sighs> one yeah, that's what I'd say. I'd say, hey, I don't know. I don't know what it is. Can't remember. Maybe that's the password. I don't know. One. And that's the joke. Bitcoin stored on software known as a digital wallet, secured through encryption, passwords used as a decryption key to open the wallet and access the Bitcoin. Password is lost. The user cannot open the wallet. Uh, He'd been sentenced to more than two years in jail for covertly installing software on other computers to harness their power to mine or make more Bitcoin. It's a little bit of a hacker. How great is that? Show up at work every day? Hey, uh, computers are running slow, Jim. (laughs) Yeah, let me see what I can do about that, guys. Yeah. Oh, they seem to be running even slower. I don't should, know. should probably buy more. <laughs> but but <laughs> we, we need to double the size of this fleet of, of computers. I'm not sure that there is a takeaway with that, OG, over and above Bitcoin doing what it was designed to do. We'll have a bigger takeaway for our second headline. But you know what time it is? It's Monday, OG, which means it is TikTok Monday. And usually we will play some of the dumbest advice we've seen on TikTok. And oh, gee, there's a little bit of dumb advice there. But today we feature a TikTok musical act. Sing it. We're going to take Dogecoin to the moon. Making this crypto mean one dollar soon. I'm hoping it's safe. We can assume. Don't actually assume. Bitcoin would be thirty thousand dollars. Basically, anything can happen at this point. Two, three. We're gonna take Dogecoin to the moon. Dogecoin to the moon. I love how I love how she sings. It's safe. We can assume. We actually don't assume that. Finally, some good advice on TikTok. If you've got some uh, TikTok. Crazy just you want to share with us, send it to me, Joe at stackybenjamins.com. Dogecoin going to the moon, by the way, OG. Allegedly. Exciting news in crypto land. And you're hearing exactly what I'm hearing, that there's a pullback coming. Somebody the other day said there's a pullback coming. 
I think the answer is what you and I've been saying for a long time. How the hell do you know when there's a pullback coming in, in crypto? Yeah. And then Elon Musk announced that he just bought a billion and a half dollars worth of it <laughs> and it goes up 30%. Yeah. So much for your pullback. Yeah, not not so much. Our second headline comes to us from money.com and this is this is an uh, important headline because you hear these I'm going to call them schemes. And I think we'll get into this a little bit, but you hear these uh, ideas that people have. You've seen this strategy before. This piece by the way is written by Samantha Sharf uh, for Money. YouTube's favorite mortgage strategy is millions of fans. Here's how it actually works. This walks through a concept OG called velocity banking and velocity banking kind of works like this. I'm going to give you the short form today. And then if you want more, just head to our show notes at stackingbenjamins.com. And this piece really walks through it, but you take out a mortgage check, and then you take out a home equity loan check you max out the home equity loan, home equity line, of, excuse me, home equity line of credit. That's, that's, that's a key point. Max okay. out the home equity line of credit Build and pool. put all that money on the mortgage. Oh, oops. And the reason is, where were you a couple of years ago? <laughs> the reason is, is that when it comes to the way the interest is charged on them, you're playing this arbitrage game between the way interest is charged on your mortgage. It's an amortization table versus the fact that it is based on daily balance in your home equity loan. And then that's not all. If you can do it, max out credit cards and do the same thing. And then very quickly, very, very quickly pay off the credit cards, pay off that home equity loan and do it again. And the faster that you can do that, and this piece walks through the math, the faster that you'll pay off your mortgage. Your mortgage will, will be paid off in lightning speed when compared to if you just 30 year, 15 year it. What happens if along the way you take your HELOC money, build a pool, buy a car and send your kid to college? Well, it's funny you say that because Samantha in this piece says exactly what I think you and I think about this. Oh, gee, this is a great strategy. There's nothing wrong with the math on this strategy. The problem Assuming is- Assuming that the math is right. The I didn't do it. Did you do the math? Uh, yes, I have done the math. And I've seen you the math done, done the math. Okay. several times. Uh, so I believe the math. Maybe the math is okay. wrong. Somebody wants to write to us and tell me the math is wrong. But But here's the point. It's not about the math. Samantha says it works great until it doesn't. And what she means by that is exactly what you said. The second something comes up, you now have a maxed out HELOC, which if you keep that long term. Yeah, that sucks. The way it is, it's ugly. You got maxed out credit cards. If you can't do the quick revolving thing for a long period of time, it stinks. And that, by the way, and, and this brings up another strategy that we hear about all the time called infinite banking, which also, by the way, great math using whole life insurance. And if everything goes great, yeah, yeah. It's your interest rate on your cash reserve is always fantastic. You have money when you need it, not going to walk through infinite banking, but the same thing. It works until your cash flow dries up OG. And the next thing you know, you're losing your insurance. You've got, <laughs> you've got this big problem on your hands. Now, what happens if you do all the things that she said, and instead of putting it, you know, your HELOC and your max out your credit cards, you instead put it on Dogecoin? Well, then you're going to the moon. I mean, then, then forget the whole strategy. You just make one payment to the mortgage to pay it off like day after tomorrow. Here's what you do. You put $37 in Dogecoin, pay off your half a million dollar house two days later. Speaking of crypto, I did see an article that uh, a guy I follow on Twitter sent out it was referencing him. He had bought a uh, piece of property in Lake Tahoe. He's a tech entrepreneur and had gazillions of dollars. And it was one of the first Bitcoin transactions for such a large purchase. So he had he had purchased this place in Lake Tahoe for about a million and a half dollars, but he used Bitcoin and it was like I 500 saw Bitcoin. I saw this. And he's like, yeah, so that thing cost me $30 million in today's dollars. And then, and then the next tweet, he goes, actually, I figured it out wrong. It was $130 million. Was it really? Yeah. But that could be said for any investment. 
when you spend cash today, you're sure. you're betting on the future, right? I mean, you're you're mortgaging the future. So what now? Obviously, you could say that for Tesla. If you spent, you know, that was the thing that came out that came out with Tesla. If you would have bought a new Tesla in 2012, it was 70 grand. Instead of investing money in Tesla, 70,000, you'd have 7 million today or a seven-year-old car, eight-year-old car. You know, but those even, are the two differences. even more conservative investing, I mean, just a regular S&P 500 index fund is taking money that you could spend today and hopefully yep. creating a lot more money for the future. Or buy lake houses and... You know, like, oh, it's beautiful. I bet that's appreciated too, though. I mean, it, it, it isn't appreciated that it fast. Di- it didn't go to zero. You're right. <laughs> that's right. God's right. not making any more land. <laughs> Am I right? We hear, I want to get back to these strategies, though, OG, that uh, we hear these strategies all the time. And the math is not the problem with the strategy. It's that life happens. Yeah. I mean, that's the whole thing with any personal finance thing is that it's not, it's not a math equation. You know, people ask whether or not they should do the 15-year or 30-year mortgage. And I say, well, it just depends. Do you want the house paid off in 15 years or do you want it paid off in 30? And they say, well, no, 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 no. Like, should I do the 30 and invest for 15? I go, let me tell you something. 22 years, I have dealt with every form and fashion of every scheme possible for every money-making, saving thing that's ever existed. I've seen it all. I have never, ever, 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 never, ever, ever, ever seen somebody who took the 30-year mortgage, figured out the 15-year payment, put the 15-year payment into their brokerage account, and then I at totally the 15-year mark... I totally have. I used, to do off, this, it off. I used to do this with my clients all the time. Sure, but that was back in the aught whatevers when interest rates were really high. I'm talking about today. I've never seen it because you get to the point where where your brokerage account is worth $350,000 and your house is Oh, you mean pay it off. I thought you meant the strategy. Yeah. No, no, no. I'm yeah, yeah, saying yeah, yeah. take the 30, invest for 15, and then in 15, write a check for half a million. I have never seen that either. Why? The math says, duh, because you get to a half a million dollars in your account and you're like, I'm not taking this out. That's stupid. Because that half a million is pulling down 50 grand a year of appreciation. Why would I do that? So it's got to be what's important to you because the math, the math doesn't say get a 30 year mortgage. The math says go get a 600 year mortgage. Right. The bank will let you, you know, they, they were doing 50 year mortgages at one point. I think they kind of backed off of those, but that the math says to do that, you know? So if you want to be debt free or if you want to have your house paid off, or if you say, Hey, like in our family, we did a 15 year because I think the rates are great. And I also don't like paying the bank, but it also times out really nicely to when my daughter goes to college. Cause I'm like, Oh, Perfect. A, she'll be super smart, so she's probably going to get a full ride somewhere. Sure. And B, then I don't have a mortgage payment. I'm I'm rich, yo. Yeah. That's the plan. Done. So that's how it worked for us. But the math doesn't say to do the 15. The math says to do 30 or 50 or whatever. You know, the math also says go get a 0% credit card, you know, for the next two-year balance transfer and put all that crap in your brokerage account on margin. But you don't do that because it's stupid. And it doesn't always work out that way because of the human nature of it, the emotional aspect of it. That 0% stuff is a, or at least low interest rate credit card stuff, big part of this uh, velocity banking. It, it It is interesting and it's not about the math. I've had people in the past say, well, punch holes in the math. I can't punch holes in the math. It's not about the math. It's that something's going to change. And when something changes, you go, oh, I can't afford to do this anymore. Oh boy. Oh boy. In just a second, OG and I will have our takeaways from today's headlines. But I think a big takeaway, OG, if you're somebody that's been watching the financial markets at all lately, you must be thinking, probably should get in this. I probably should do a little investing and maybe not in a Vegas way, maybe invest much more for your long-term goals. And as you know, managing your money has typically been complicated time-consuming, just another reason to bite your nails. But for half a million investors who have accounts with them on finance, investing smarter, more automated, and easier than ever. Do yourself a favor this year. Check out M1. This finance super app's designed to be personalized for your needs, and their automation tools make it simpler to reach your financial goals. With M1, you can invest how you want with access to fractional shares and unmatched automation, all for free. You can borrow against your investments at super low rates, just two to three and a half percent. So you can do your velocity banking, just little sarcasm there. 
and use this flexible line of credit for anything like investing more in your portfolio, refinancing other loans, or funding large projects. M1 ties it together in a free digital account so you can have more flexibility and smoother money movements. Just keep in mind, borrowing involves higher risks and rates may vary. Visit m1finance.com forward slash SB to sign up and you'll get 30 bucks to invest because you're a stacker. Again, Visit m1finance.com forward slash SB to sign up and get $30 to invest. Terms and conditions apply. I think our takeaways, number one is if you get busted by the German cops, OG, don't give up the password. Duh. Second, if you want to be a hit on social media, make a song about Dogecoin. But then I think the real takeaway is it's not always about math, right? Not always about math. More often than not, it ends up being about behavior. Well, to say that our guest today is an interesting fellow is the understatement of the year. Matthew Pollard is uh, responsible for five multimillion dollar business success stories. And he did that all before 30 years old overachiever dork he's got a heck of a story and we'll ask him a little bit about his story today uh forbes calls him the real deal global gurus list him as a top 30 sales professional he teaches people that this way that we have networked in the past not only does it not work for a lot of us so if you feel awkward when you're ever at these networking events or you're meeting new people you're not alone. Anybody who's at all introverted or just doesn't like those, I think is going to like Matthew's way of uh, doing things better. Let's say hello to him right now, Matthew Pollard. And on my dad, Shortwave Radio, it's our new friend, Matthew Pollard. How are you, man? I'm doing terrific, mate. I'm so happy to be on your show. Well, I'm happy that you could be here with us. It's funny because in a, a lot of people in my audience don't know this. I'm a guy who, as a young professional, learned to go to the networking meetings that you talk about at the beginning of your book, right? Learn how to control my heartbeat a little bit, learn how to speak on stage. But I'm definitely an introvert. So when I, when I heard about your book, I thought, oh my, finally somebody who can make this easy. So it's personal for me having you on, but I know for you, this is personal because you moved halfway around the world. Tell me that story. (laughs) Well, look, I'm glad it's personal for you. And I'm glad you're talking about that. You know, when I first bought out my first book, The Introvert's Edge, which focused on selling, it was like no sales trainer, no sales influencer anywhere wanted to admit that they were introverted. And it was like, it was a dirty word. Like the introverts are those people under a bridge, like don't talk to me. And that's just, it's just not what introversion is. I mean, introversion is just where you draw your energy from. And, you know, we were talking just before the show, Zig Ziglar, the most well-known sales trainer in the world was an introvert. Ivan Meisner, the founder of BNI was an introvert. Now for people that don't know BNI, it's the world's largest networking group, you know, 10,000 membership groups across the globe. If an introvert can start that, I think every introvert list probably has a chance. Though I have to say, when I moved from Australia to the US, I mean, I was terrified. I mean, I'd had a good network in Australia because I'd been responsible for five multi-million dollar success stories, but I'd awkwardly fostered this network. And then when I moved to the US, the only person I knew was my now wife, and she was more introverted than I was, and she just moved to Austin herself. So here we are knowing nobody and literally had to go to the through the process of learning to network, which is terrible. I mean, my first experience was walking down in the apartment complex that we were renting at the time, and I got chatting with this person that I hoped would one day be a friend. He asked me what I did, and I said, oh, I'm a sales trainer. And he looked at me like I was one step above a scam artist because he'd had a bad experience in the past. And I'm like, well, wait, now I'm trying to explain why I'm different. Like what? I'm wearing magic ruby slippers. And I'm like, all right, I'm never going to do that again. I'm never going to say sales. So I'll say, oh, I'm a marketing specialist. So I went to a networking event and said, oh, I'm a marketing specialist. And people would say, oh, I need marketing. How much do you cost? And what? Now I'm talking about price. I mean, this was horrible. And I looked at other people in the networking room and I saw how they did it. It was like, they'd walk up. Do you want to buy from me? No. What about you? What about you? I'm yeah. not doing that. 
but everyone else is hiding in a corner, having shallow conversations going, oh, I'm not here to really talk in detail about what I do. They just walked out with stacks of business cards that they never contacted. And I was like, you know what? I have to find a different way because there's, I mean, networking doesn't work that way. That's why people walk out thinking it's a waste of time. The truth is it does work and introverts can be amazing at it. They're just doing it wrong. This all resonated with me because I went to BNI meetings early in my career as a financial planner. And you go through this at the beginning of your book, Matthew, talking about just how damn uncomfortable it is for everybody. You gave your <laughs> slimy sales pitch. I gave my slimy sales pitch. We think we don't need each other. And so one of us has to excuse ourselves to go get something to drink or go to the bathroom just to get the hell out of there. And the other person standing there says, oh, thank God. Like it's a, it's a nightmare for what would what, you say? 70% of the people. Well, I would say 95% of the people. I mean, even the people that we look at going, wow, they're doing it well. I wish I could be more like those people. They're the transactional people that are literally running around the room trying to get people to buy. I mean, I don't don't want to be one of those people. I think that the hurdle we all face is that's how we see networking. And I think the biggest problem for introverts especially is – we cause that. It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Like we start off at thinking, okay, I've just lost my job. I need to get a job. I need to go networking or the pipeline's looking a little bit thin. I've just lost a client. I, especially during COVID, okay, I now need to figure out a way to network. And then all of a sudden you, you find this networking event, whether it be virtual, whether you're using something like lunch club to do virtual networking or whether you, you go to a BNI event and you book it in. And then you try to do your best to forget all about it because the last thing you want to do is think about that horrible event you've got to go to. So you blast it from your mind until you get that 30-minute reminder saying you've got to get in the car and you've got to go. And then you're horrified. Well, you spend the next 10 minutes talking yourself out of it, right? Right. I don't want to go. Things aren't really that bad. It's not that desperate. But then you go, and of course, what do we do? We dart around the room. Is there someone here I know? Is there someone here I know? If they do, we latch onto them, and we try and talk to those people. But we're there to meet new people, these people we already know. So what we see is, oh, gosh, there is no one there that we already know. Let's go and talk to someone new. That's actually a more positive thing. But then we end up talking to that person that sells insurance, right? And they're like, oh, what do you? What does it you do? Oh, I sell insurance. Oh my God, how do I get away from this person? Well, firstly, in today's world, a live event, I mean, it's probably got a Facebook page. It's probably got a LinkedIn group. It's probably on meetup.com, which means people have registered to come with their LinkedIn profiles. So you can actually do your research before you go. Firstly, you should know if you're a PR agency, your ideal clients are not going to be at the PR agency meetup. So don't convince yourself that that's networking. But you can find what is my ideal marketplace. For me, it's introverted service providers. So that's where I go, where those people hang out. Then I will say, okay, this is the meetup or this is the group that I'm going to go and visit. Let's have a look at who's registered to go. And I'll look at their LinkedIn profiles and the people that I'd like to talk to, I post them a a connection request earlier and say, hey, I'm coming to this networking event. I've heard some great things about it. Would you suggest that I come along? And they'll say, yeah, sure. Now, of course, they might be introverted too. So when I walk in the room, guess what? I'm the face that they recognize. So they're going to come straight up and talk to me. So now it feels like a bunch of pre-planned meetings. And as long as I have a plan as well, for what to say, those conversations could be very, very different. And secondly, as long as I make it all about them at the beginning, then I'm going to get the opportunity to explain because they are genuinely interested. Everything can shift by understanding 90% of networking success happens before you even walk in to the first room. I want to dive into a few of those strategies. But first, one point that you made in the book that I don't want to overlook is in the United States, and it might be worldwide. I don't know if you saw this in Australia as well, but there is this slash and burn this, you called it transactional way of selling that we all think, you know, when you told somebody you're a sales trainer, they're like, oh no, 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 stay away from me. You're a pariah, right? Because we have this idea of what a salesperson is. And you talk about the history of that, which I think is important for people to know, like this is because of the way that cities grew. Can you go through the history of why we have such transactional sales ideas? Yeah, firstly, and by the way, this transactional sales is also not great. And the thing that I love is that we're starting to get back to the way that it should be. But I mean, if we think about sales, what happened is back in the days, we all lived in country towns. If I was going to sell to my local neighbor, Joe, or the guy down the street, Joe, I've got to be really careful that my product delivers. And I've got to make sure I sell it the right way because I'm going to walk past Joe every Every morning on the way to work. Like there is no way I'm going to do anything wrong. 
Well, what happened is as we bought out mass manufacturing and all of a sudden this company was producing more stock than they could sell to their local community, then they started to hire these people called traveling salespeople. And traveling salespeople would go into a city and would blast through the town. And in truth, they'd say whatever they needed to to get the deal because they're not going to be there tomorrow. Yeah. So it was always based on how can I strike up a conversation more effectively and how can I get out quickly? And you know, the fact that the product works is a bonus, but not really a necessity as long as the commissions are high. Now, my belief is that that is still better if you've got a really great salesperson that doesn't use bulldog techniques and hard closing. I still think someone with a great sales system would perform better even in that situation. But it wasn't seen as a necessity to train someone that way. But what happened is that then led to all of these transactional salespeople, which kind of has that used car feel salesperson yeah. to it. But then we did it with networking. We all moved into these big cities and we went, oh, I, I need to get a new job. I, I need to sell somebody my product or my wares. And I mean, let's face it, I could be in New York City, Melbourne, Australia, and I could speak to someone, sell them a product, deliver the product, and never see them again. So that transactional network sales approach applied to networking as well. The thing I love about where we are today is you can't get away from anyone these days, right? If I come on and I'm a pitch fest on this podcast interview, Joe is going to be connected with me on LinkedIn, and he's probably going to write me a bad review. Or he's, you know, he's not going, next time I talk to someone, they're going to go, oh, you're connected with Joe. I'll check in with Joe to see if he was a good guest. Well, no, Joe said no, so I'm not going to have him on my show either. These days, we're actually getting back more to those little country towns where everyone knows each other. So what I love to see is the soul is actually coming back into sales and networking. But truthfully, it actually worked better with a soul anyway. The problem is the way people viewed it was wrong. And that's why people hated it in the first place and felt that they had to use more manipulative, coercive ideologies to sell, which to me, I don't want to do. And to be honest with, I mean, you know, my backstory, I went from struggling to sell, having no business being in sales to being the number one salesperson in the company by teaching myself a sales system, watching YouTube videos after being one of the most introverted people on the planet, scared of my own shadow. If I can do that, not using a single bulldog technique and hard clothes, you can absolutely do it in the networking room. Well, and this is what I like best though, Matthew, is that not only is it better for the customer and for the relationship, for you, it's a hell of a lot more fun and you can sleep better at night. I had a bunch of crappy sales jobs in college and I think a lot of people, a lot of us have, right? Had a lot of those. And when you transform to uh, uh, much more of a, well, actually let's get into it. You say four, four things at the beginning of your book. You say that being being strategic, being prepared, practicing, and knowing how to cultivate deeper relationships with just a few of exactly the right people is what we want to do. And if we break those apart, maybe give us just a tip on each of these. Let's talk about that first part, Matthew, being strategic. Where do we start with our strategy of really doing this right? Well, firstly, we have to understand that we can't define ourselves by a functional skill. So what I see a lot of people do when they go into networking rooms is Somebody will say, oh, what is it you do? And we respond with our functional skill. I'm a business coach. I'm a marketing specialist. I'm an accountant. And or in the example we gave in the past, I'm an insurance person, right? Now, anytime we hear that, what happens is our brain is programmed to put somebody in a box and disqualify them or decide that we want them, which is why we leave, we always have a, oh, no, I've, I've already got an account and I don't need that. Or, oh, you're a sales trader. You're a scam artist. I don't want you kind of perspective. The goal is to not be seen as a commodity, to not be defined by one of those boxes. So because we were so hard on insurance salespeople before, let's use that as an example. I had an insurance person that came to me and he said, Matt, I love selling insurance. He said, but anytime I go to a networking event, they just look at me and they're like, oh my God, scam artist is trying to sell me stuff. It's like their eyes scream and they're trying to get to the bathroom or the bar as quickly as possible. He's like, what can I do to change that up? And I said, well, let's go back to what drove you to be passionate about insurance. And he said, well, I just like to help people. And I said, all right, well, sure you do. But do you like to help people that make 50,000 a year or 250? And he went, well, 250. I said, why? He said, well, the people that's, that make 250 I can sell them more stuff. And I'm like, no, you can't really go to a customer and say, you know what? I really love working with you because you're going to get me my Bentley. <laughs> right. So let's try and come up with something different. What about somebody that runs, uh, that studied hard, got into Harvard, got that C-level executive job, and now they employ, you know, they, they, they manage a bunch of people that make 250000 a year, or that person that maybe didn't even go to university but started their own business, now they employ a bunch of people and they make about 250 a year. 
He said, well, obviously the small business owner. I said, why obviously? I mean, the guy hustled to get into Harvard, to get into that career. I just, I just feel like they deserve it more. I'm like, explain that to me. He then started telling me about his grandfather and how his grandfather had hustled all this time to start his own farm. He employed all these people. He never prioritized himself. And then his grandfather got sick and he had to sell the farm to pay the medical bills. And because of all the time off, he just couldn't afford the farm. He said, the last 10 years of my grandfather's life, I just watched him literally die in front of that TV away. He said, I just never want to see someone else live like that. I said, all right, here's what I want you to do. Do you think that these are the hustlers of the world? He's like, yes. I said, why don't we call you the hustle lifeguard instead? And then when somebody asks, what is that? Now, if you plan correctly, you should make it all about them. Ask them questions, give them value until they're like, oh my gosh, Joe, I can't believe I've been talking about myself for the last 10 minutes. Tell me about you. What is it you do? Oh, I'm the hustle lifeguard. They're going to have a brain meltdown. What is that? They're going to ask. And then you can talk about your passion and mission for not letting anyone get stuck in that horrible life like your grandfather did. You can even go into a story of a customer that you worked with that was almost heading down that same journey and how you helped them. And thank gosh you did because a few years later, this all went wrong. Well, his business transformed because all of a sudden he introduced himself differently. People could see his passion. They wanted to work with him. And he went from working for another organization where things were going well. He went, you know, was an amazing performer. Now he runs his own business as the hustle lifeguard and succeeds doing that. Funnily enough, his niche was small business owners, but all these career professionals were like, Nick, I know you don't work with us. I know you only you work exclusively with small businesses, but I love your passion. Can I work with you too? Everything shifted because he didn't fit in that box. So when we talk about strategy, what I have discovered is that if you can't be the clearest, you have to be the loudest. So what happens, you have to go to more networking events. You have to yell over other people. You have to use those techniques that nobody wants. What I think is that the reason for that is because people can't articulate the value of what they provide in three minutes when people are politely listening. So if you have the strategy to do that right, then all of a sudden everything shifts. And funnily enough, it actually shifts online as well. Because if you can't articulate your value in three minutes when someone's politely listening, what chance do you have when you're trying to network digitally, which is why people are resorting to those horrible spam messages that we're seeing all the time on LinkedIn, on Facebook, blast selling on emails. No one wants them, but they're focused on the numbers game. Well, who do we hear numbers game all the time from? Really bad salespeople, yeah. right? That is what everyone focuses on because the strategy is wrong. Yeah, that's that's powerful stuff. And you know what I like best about that was that he went from selling insurance to get his Bentley and being me focused. Really, he went to the reason people buy insurance in the first place to protect. I mean, he's, he's selling something that people need to buy and want to buy. And that makes him even feel better. Well, he loved it. I mean, that's the big difference. And this is really important when it comes to strategy. See, for an introvert, we have to understand that firstly, we're not second class citizens. Our path to success is just different, but we have to realize the truth that being with people takes our energy from us. Now, that doesn't mean we can't do it. It just means that it takes, it's like we're deep, you know, we've got a cell phone and it's not currently charged in. We're an extrovert. They love being around people. So when they do a networking event, they want to go to the next one. They want to go off to the bar. That's just not us. So the thing that I realized, though, is the reason, one of the reasons, of course, it's always going to be tolling on us to be with people. However, one of the biggest drivers for why it's so, so tolling is that stress and that anxiety of feeling uncomfortable. Well, if we plan out what we're going to say and we do great preparation, if we know who we're going into the room to speak to, all of a sudden there's a lot less anxiety. Secondly, if we get a rejection, it's a lot less mentally tolling on us because if we have a sales system or a networking system, the great thing is it's not about us anymore. It's about the system. So we can use our analytical brain and say, this is where it went wrong. So I can change that. That, and that might get me a better success. It stops being a rejection on us, right. which is huge. Yeah. And that now it's just people that don't need what you have, which is, which is fine. That's good. absolutely. And if you're passionate about it, this is the great thing. If you're trying to make it, eye focused about getting my Bentley, or if you're trying to make it all about, I need to sell this product. When somebody feels that says to you, I don't feel like that, you know, that works for me. 
it, you've got to shove it down their throat or at least you feel like you have to. But if you're focused on your passion and your mission, I'm sure Nick's grandfather probably would have thought originally that's probably not for me. But Nick passionately believes that he needs to save people like that, that are in their own way. He's on a mission to help them realize. So instead, he says, I perfectly understand. Last thing I want to do is waste any of your time. However, let me tell you a story of my grandfather. or Let me tell you a story of this customer. And then by the way, the science of story is powerful because it short circuits the logical mind. You speak directly to the emotional mind. The logical brain's part going, that won't work for me. This will. I don't really have time for that. Just go away or bathroom time. The emotional brain just listens. It goes story time and it listens to everything and hears the moral. Like, oh, your grandfather was like that. And if he didn't make this decision, his life would have been much you know, worse off. People also remember up to 22 times more information when embedded into a story. And wow. here's the critical one. It activates the reticular activating system of the brain. So when I tell a story, what happens is your brain and my brain and all the listeners listening, when they heard Nick's story, our brains all synchronize. It creates artificial rapport, which allows me to leverage into real rapport. So again, if you're planning as an introvert, especially, instead of being stuck in your head, worried about what to say, if you already have a story and you've already asked great questions, all your brain is using is their ability to actively listen and empathize to attach that story to them and their unique situation. That's why we are superpower networkers, as long as we're doing it correctly. There was this uh, very good uh, mystery novelist who would write about the Navajo Indian tribe, Tony Hillerman. And Tony Hillerman's main protagonist, his name was Joe Leaphorn. And I think about what you're talking about, Matthew, and he always had what he called his I share something rule. He would go into a bank teller. He's trying to figure out stuff that he's not allowed to know. He would share something about him. And because he would share a story about him, the bank teller then was more likely to open up about them. Uh, I think Tony Robbins says there's a few things that are truths. That as I hear you talk about this, I just think about this truth of storytelling, how we're just built for it and how passion is. I want to ask you one more thing, though, on a whole different topic, which is preparation, which is the next piece that you have. And you mentioned that for an introvert being prepared. And by the way, that makes me feel really good when you say that. I think there's nothing and you know this better than I do. There's nothing an introvert likes better than preparation, right? Mm -hmm. I, I feel much more comfortable. I feel in my game. I don't have to be Joe light up the room guy. I can be Joe prepared guy. But you also know better than I do that if you tell an introvert to prepare, they will never go do anything. They'll, they'll just spend all day preparing. So what do we do specifically to prepare for these networking opportunities that we have so that we actually get something done? Absolutely. So, I mean, by the way, you know, most people don't know this. Bill Murray is actually an introvert. And I remember watching this movie, Groundhog Day, and you'd, you'd watch him. I mean, he's so dynamic, but you'd watch him. He, what he would do is every day to him, the most, most of the day went exactly the same. For everyone else, it felt organic. For him, he was going through the motions because he would, had well rehearsed from all the days before it. But they got to a point where it became too rehearsed and it became, you know, and it, and it had diminishing returns. So for the average introvert that's listening, what you've got to realize is you set yourself some rules. What I would suggest is that the first thing you need to do is go through and plan how you introduce yourself, which is what I call a unified message. You know, I call myself the rapid growth guy. Nick called himself the, the hustle lifeguard. Other people call themselves the narrative strategist, the China success coach, which triggers the conversation. You need to know what script to use. And yes, I use the word script, but by the way, all actors use scripts too. And by the way, don't they seem really authentic and organic? Scripting if you sound robotic, it's just lack of practice. The people that are reading off sheets, that's why they sound robotic. You need to embody it. And the great thing is you're not trying to pretend like you're a character from the 1950s. Right. You're just trying to portray the best version of yourself. So if you plan that and allocate time to writing out what you plan to say, writing out your stories, then all of a sudden you'll start to feel more comfortable. So you need to allocate. And I, I don't talk about taking months of work. I would suggest you can do all of this within several weeks. I would block out some time to work out exactly what to say. And, you know, my publisher hates me to say this. You don't need to buy my book. You can get the framework from the introvertsedge.com forward slash networking in the first chapter. Now, when you do that, if you plan two to three hours of writing out what you're going to say, then the next thing you want to do is spend a couple of hours and literally a couple of hours just practicing it. And what will happen, I call it punishing your brain, is whenever you go off script, oh, I can't remember what to say. No, you start again and you go through it again. Then once you get to the point where you can recite it clearly, then 
Ask your wife or your husband to play devil's advocate and be the hard customer so that you can speak to them, you can talk to them, and they're, oh, I don't know if that'll work for me, and they try and change the subject and they talk about things. That will allow you to have practice, and they'll give you the opportunity to learn all those little subtle things that happen in a networking event. But then cut the cord, go to a networking event. So here's the rule I will give you. Book a networking event for two to three weeks from now, virtual or live, depending on which country you're living in, because my Australian friends can go off to networking events now because COVID doesn't exist there. So wherever you are, either book a virtual or a real life networking event for three weeks time, then schedule, reverse engineer it, engineer, you know, our analytical brains are great at that, reverse engineer it, allocate Call it three hours with a family member or a friend over the course of two sittings, ideally an hour because that'll exhaust you, and then two hours because you'll be a lot better at it the second time. Then before that, make sure you've got some practice time. Again, I would suggest three hours for that, and then reverse engineer three hours worth of preparation and getting that set. Now, you may want to read my book or someone else's book on networking because I'm not the only one giving you a system. The truth is there are multiple systems out there, but pick one mentor because networking sales is not like mixed martial arts. It's not better if you have multiple systems. It gets confusing. Keep it simple and make sure you go through the motions of practicing, but pull the cord and get out to that event. I wish you knew what you're talking about. I wish you had some, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, me, me too, mate. I mean, the, the, I, I wish I wrote a book on networking or something like that, right? <laughs> if only you had a book on this. The book is called The Introvert's Edge to Networking. I'm assuming people get it everywhere, Matthew. Yeah, and for me, I mean, because most people don't, if you don't know this from my backstory, I had a reading speed of a sixth grader in late high school. So for me, the reason I flocked to YouTube was because books just wouldn't work for me. So I know it's funny that I now have a book. I work with an amazing ghostwriter and, you know, that was really, really helpful. But what I can tell you is it's available on audio book as well. It's of course on Kindle and things like that, but the audio book does amazingly well. And especially because I write my books like novels. So I want you to, you know, let's face it, learning how to sell, learning how to network, can be a, feel a little bit confrontational for, for an introvert. So instead, I write mine like novels. I want you to laugh out loud with the characters. They're all real people in the book, but I want you to enjoy it, the stories and the people and just happen to learn sales or networking throughout the process. I got to tell you, to your point, man, the stories in the book are so powerful. Charlene, just right at the beginning of the book, who wants to be a gardener, like starting with somebody who is the least salesy person of all, a gardener, and her story is, I mean, just powerful stuff. Oh, and she was in her 60s as well. I mean, she won multiple small business awards after that transformation, but she thought she was never going to succeed. And I, you know, one of the things I love about her is in one of our video interviews she did recently, she said this, it's never too late to live your dreams. I love the fact that introverts that believe that they just can never be exceptional at anything actually find out they can be exceptional at anything they put their mind to. They just have to bring our way this artificial wall that they've built for themselves. It doesn't actually exist. It's funny because really people couch this in networking and selling, which is often affiliated with, with networking. But I immediately, when I dug into that story, thought about this older friend of mine who's in her 60s. Sadly, her husband died and she just, oh. two or three years ago, he died. And now she feels like dating again, but she's an introvert. And I immediately thought of your book because I thought you get back out on the dating scene and you go into these rooms of people. It's, it was, it, it's so helpful. I just tore through it. So Thanks for spending some time with us talking about being an introvert and about uh, networking. I super appreciate it. It was my absolute pleasure. I really hope that this message helps so many of your listeners. Hey, trivia fans, I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and now let's whip this show into action. Wow, these script ideas really don't work anymore now that Joe's mom informed me what an introvert actually is. Hey, but I'm a, I'm a professional, so we're just going to run with it. Now that you're all chained up and ready to go, ride this cowboy. Oh, boy. Uh, let's get to today's trivia. <laughs> Man, there are some kinks in this, I mean, problems uh, in this trivia. Since today's show is all about, apparently, introverts, which not at all perverts, introverts, how many people out of the average group of 10 people is an introvert? Actually, that question would have been better the other way. Anyway, how many people out of 10 are an introvert? I'll be back with your answer faster than you can let loose and get wild 
Okay, this is really not working anymore. If you're an active duty service member, veteran, DOD, civilian, or military family member like I am, you can join Navy Federal. That means if you've served in any branch of the military, it doesn't have to be the Navy, like my dad, could be the Army, the Marine Corps, like my brother-in-law, Eric, and uh, this dude sitting across the table from me, Mr. OG. What's up? Our friend, Lacey Langford, another podcaster in the Air Force, or the Coast Guard, you can join Navy Federal Credit Union. On average, Navy Federal members earn and save $361 more per year. You can pay no fees, get low rates and rate discounts, plus earn cash back and grow your savings. Navy Federal puts members first by helping them save money, make money, and enjoy peace of mind and security through personalized around-the-clock service. Plus, now's a great time to join. Have a large credit card balance after the holidays? Let Navy Federal Credit Union help you rebalance your priorities. Make a plan to do away with high interest credit card debt and transfer your balance to a Navy Federal credit card. With a low intro APR and no balance transfer fees, you can pick the right card to help you take back control. Visit NavyFederal.org. Navy Federal Credit Union, our members are the mission. Insured by NCUA, dollar value of Navy Federal's 2019 member give back study, 5.99 to 18% variable APRs. Based on product type and credit worthiness, up to $1 cash advance transaction fee at non-Navy Federal ATMs. Hey, stackers, do you pay your credit cards off in full every month? Well, if so, you probably know that any credit card can offer cash back, but only Discover matches all the cash back you've earned at the end of your first year. It's like getting one of those birthday cards that's shaped like cash, so you already know there's cash inside before opening it, but in this case, it's stuffed with your first year cash back match, and you don't even have to send a thank you note. Cashback match only by Discover Card. Learn more at discover.com slash match. Discover something brighter. Hey, stackers, since I should probably throw out this script, I'm just going to say the opposite of everything written, and that should work, right? All right, let, let, here, let's try it again. Hi, all of you healthy and clean fans of this appetizing podcast. I'm your guide to the virginist. Is that a word? Yeah. We're just, okay. This is a big mess. So we're going to move on to today's trivia question. The question was, how many people out of the average group of 10 people is an introvert? The estimated range is anywhere between 25 and 40%. So well, we're just going to give it to you if you said like three or four people out of 10. On that note, it's time for me to make like an introvert. Get out of here. But hey, that one actually works. See ya. Big thanks to Matthew Pollard for stopping by. Man, that guy brings it, huh? In a uh, introverted kind of way, sure. And I love that approach, not just for introverts, because as you know, OG, that uh, relationship, quote, selling relationships, way more fun than just transactional business. I, I, I think for most people. I agree. I agree. Yep. Yeah. Get to know somebody, bring your best self. I remember when we talked to Maury Teherapur about negotiating, you know, lots of negotiating styles. And she's like, be authentic, be your best self. And people tend to want to give you a better deal. If you're very much yourself, you don't have to be the beat them down kind of person. I think this is uh, synergistic. Hey, let's throw out the Haven Lifeline OG and tackle some of life's most important questions. Our friends at Haven Life Insurance Agency, they put the thing you value first. On this wintry, blustery, blustery day as we celebrate George Washington's birthday. I value hot cocoa with marshmallows. Oh, and a roaring fire. Yes, sure, fire. You can have the fire as long as I get the cocoa. All right, deal. You know, I had a toasted marshmallow latte last weekend. Sounds pretty good. Yeah, I, was, I, I just thought, I, I got to try this thing. And it was phenomenal. Just like a candy cane in a glass or a kid's drink in a glass. It was It was so, so good. It actually says here that it's your loved ones and your time, but heck, loved ones in time with a hot cocoa or a toasted marshmallow latte, isn't that just like an upscale hot cocoa? Yes. <laughs> it really is. It's a hot cocoa for foo-foo people. Oh, I wouldn't go near the hot cocoa. 
I would like a toasted marshmallow latte, please. That's why they've made buying quality term life insurance actually simple so you can spend more time with that latte. Head to stackybenjamins.com forward slash Haven Life now to get a free quote. Their application is way simpler than the ones that I had clients go through when I back when I was a financial planner. You get an instant coverage decision. Their prices are affordable. Get on with your life. Get great coverage. It was good to see. I just saw a list of uh, top five innovations, top five innovating companies in life insurance and saw Haven Life there, which was awesome. Something that we already know. Today, let's throw out the lifeline to our friend, Justin. Say hi, Justin. Hey, Joe and OG. I was looking at getting my daughter interested in stocks and her favorite game, Roblox, is about to go public. When I was looking up info about it, they were saying that they weren't going to do an IPO, but instead would do a direct listing. Can you explain the differences between an IPO and a direct listing? Also, I know that you have talked about how people who buy the IPO almost never get the IPO price. Is this true with the direct listing as well? I know a little bit about buying stocks, but would definitely consider myself a novice. So is there anything else with this type of offering that I should be aware of before getting into it? Thanks. Justin, great question. Thanks for the question. And before I turn this over to the expert here, I I just really like the fact that you're getting her interested through something that she already likes. And the fact that she can own that, I think is a great place to start, OG. It's so exciting to see kids get involved in an early age. For us, that's why we really like that Stockpile app, because it shows the kids the brands that they're familiar with. You know, it shows Xbox instead of Microsoft. You know, I mean, everybody knows that Microsoft and Xbox, whatever. But but the kids see Pop-Tarts, not Kellogg's. And they go, oh, I eat Pop-Tarts and I play Xbox and or I play Roblox and, you know, that sort of thing. So I think that when you can tie the brand and the things that they already do business with, they can see those things in their lives and go, I own part of that. You know, that kind of helps the creation of those synapses, <laughs> you know, you know, like start yeah. figuring out that ownership is good. Yeah, I truly think that the indexes can come later. And I know that we've had people call in and people say, you know, I just buy indexes for my kids. I want to teach them that diversification. That That is fine too. It just for me, this this seems like a great way to teach your kids about ownership. So direct listing versus IPO, OG. Well, I uh, so firstly, an IPO is when a private company, they work with an investment banking firm. The investment banking firm creates a whole bunch of shares, right? They create the company. They do a whole big uh, campaign on why the company is going to be awesome. And the investment banking firm gets a whole bunch of uh, uh, revenue out of it. They're also obligated to buy a certain number of shares and distribute it to their clients to kind of create the market for this initially. And you're right. It's very difficult to get an IPO if you are on a brokerage platform like Fidelity or Schwab or TD Ameritrade. There's a link usually that says something about the upcoming IPOs and you can apply to get them. And you have to say, hey, I'm, you know, I don't know what the price is going to be. I think it's going to IPO between twenty and forty, but uh, but I'm, you know, I want to commit to a thousand shares or whatever. And maybe you'll get filled, or maybe you won't. You know, who knows? But um, but it is very difficult to get uh, the IPO price, and you're certainly not getting an IPO if you're coming to the table going, I- I'm in for a share. <laughs> I want it for my daughter. That stuff is reserved for people that are cutting million dollar checks, you know, or firms that are going to do that. That doesn't mean that you won't get the IPO price, right? Because the it could IPO, it could list, and then not go anywhere, right? The price doesn't have to move. We've seen recently that's not what's happened. You know, you hear about Airbnb or you hear about uh, DoorDash or something. They IPO'd at 20 and they're at 150 by the end of the first day. You're the guy buying it at 150. <laughs> the guy who got it at 20, he made his deal six months ago. So IPOs are very slippery. I'd stay away from them. A direct listing is very similar. And a direct listing is instead of involving all the investment bankers and creating all new stuff for the company and all that sort of stuff, they just put the thing that they have already established because there's already shares of the organization that already exist through private equity firms or through the the founders of the company or whatever. They've they've created the shares. They just list those directly. They don't create new ones. They just go, and now we all can sell this stuff. And so uh, people seem to like that because it's, you know, kind of cuts out the banker. It's a little bit of the, you know. A little bit more democratization. A little rage against the machine type of stuff. Like, oh, I can do it myself. I don't have to do it. It might be, 
you know, who knows? I've, I've never had an experience in listing a company IPO or direct listing. So I don't know what's better for the, for the shareholders, but, uh, but it's ostensibly the same thing. Eventually on the secondary market, you'll be able to buy and sell, you know, the secondary market being the stock market, you can buy and sell shares of Roblox like you would any other stock. And if you want to go buy a couple of shares for your daughter, because that's what she plays, do it. I'll tell you a funny story. What I'm he- hearing though, before you get to your story, what I'm hearing is for Justin's purposes, there's no difference. IPO direct listing. Correct. Not materially different. I wouldn't to what do it on the do. day that it lists. I would, I would let the dust settle a little bit and then decide. Wait till it hits, uh, goes up four times, then buy it. Then buy it. Right. Exactly at the peak. You'll teach your daughter a very, very, very strong lesson. And this is what happens when you day trade. Uh, my, uh, my kids, you know, we let them buy whatever they want. And the first, the first tranche of this included things like Kellogg's, you know, Pop-Tarts. And, and, but for my one son, his, his uh, game at the time was Clash of Clans, which is a game that you played on your iPad. And I'm not sure what the name of the company is. It's like, it starts with a T. But uh, let's just say they're not, they're, they're not a high flyer. <laughs> The rest of his portfolio rounded out with things like Amazon and Apple and Tesla and whatever. But yeah, so now he looks at it, he goes, Dad, why did you let me buy Clash of Clans? It's such a terrible game now. I said, hey, that's that's the lesson you learned, right? So it's okay for them to fail. That's my point. It's, it's okay for them to fail spectacularly because they're going to fail with 50 bucks, and that's perfectly fine to do. And that could be your lesson too, right? Yeah, fail big with 50 bucks so that you get to college and on your own, you don't make the $1,000 mistake. Right. You let your kids buy all their own stuff. Why Why are your kids' investments all in weed stock? Why do they own so many of those? It's what Reddit told them to do, I guess. I don't know. Thanks for the question, Justin. That's horrible. If uh, you've got a question for us, it would be funny if, if your seven-year-old owned like Cigarette companies, <laughs> he's like Budweiser, Anheuser Busch, right? <laughs> gambling, yeah, all that stuff. Hey, Dad, my DraftKings is up huge. StackyBenjamins dot com forward slash voicemail. We'll get you to the Haven Lifeline, and uh, we're going to send Justin a T shirt for being brave. And congratulations again, Justin. And by the way, you know what? Let's let's uh, send Justin two. Let's send one for him and that young investor and his family. How about that, OG? Okay start his daughter on the right path of stacking Benjamins. All right. That's going to do it for today. Lots of people to thank. We'll let Doug handle most of this. First, thanks to you for spending time with us and hanging out. We appreciate the fact that uh, you spend time hanging out with us. If you'd like to hang out more, head to our Facebook group, the basement stackybenjamins.com forward slash basement will get you the link to our Facebook group. By the way, last Monday, we talked to Mark Randolph about things that will never work. Remember how, so Mark, for those of you that missed that episode, is the co-founder of Netflix. And uh, he was told that the name Netflix, of all things, wouldn't work, wasn't, wasn't going to do it. So we asked our friends in the basement what they had been told wouldn't work. And we got some great answers, OG. Did you write this show? What's that? I said, did you write this show? Things that wouldn't work? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Things we were told. uh, 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 Really? Uh, A lightweight show about money? Bill. Bill replied, OG, that uh, going from a two-car family to a one-car family, a lot of what-if scenarios from family and friends, but the savings has helped us to reduce our debt and create more cash flow in uncertain times. I could imagine being on the family side of that. You sure you want to go to one car? What if, what if you're at home and you really want to go somewhere else? Yeah. I'm right in the middle of that. I'm trying to uh, decide what to do next for ours because I don't go anywhere. So I'm trying to push for an electric scooter. You know, I bought Cheryl one of those for her birthday and an electric bike. And you can pretty much about her a rad a uh, cargo bike and you, so she can carry your stuff on the back. It's bright orange. She loves it. You can definitely see her coming from a mile away. She, she, <laughs> the bell helps. She, ding, 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 ding. 
she can ride it like a motorcycle on the way to work. Doesn't have to pedal at all. Doesn't get sweaty and then can pedal on the way home with some assist. That thing moves, by the way, 25 miles an hour. Yeah. Uh, the motor takes you up to 20, but getting it up to 25, not, not hard beyond that. Pretty easy. But I like that. And when it's warm, she drives it every day. Uh, sadly, we've had four of those days so far that she's been <laughs> able to do it. But we get into spring. She's excited well, that'll about That'll be fine it. soon, yeah. Do it even more. Uh, my brother-in-law in here says Bitcoin because I remember a discussion he and I had early on when he was all excited about Bitcoin. Kevin says moving to Mexico and becoming permanent residents. I think we're going to do a show on that, OG, about the dangers of being expats in the future. But those are the type of things that you, you can just hear your relatives going, man, you're crazy. Yeah. But think about how many people it's worked for. Leah says working from home is a lawyer. Her family, especially her mom, thought she was crazy because she wasn't going to work for a big law firm. She wanted to work from home for a small law firm, and now she started her own. And uh, mom didn't think she could do it, working from home. I think that must, that really is an age thing, isn't it? Because I don't think anybody who's, I don't know what, 35 or younger working from home, especially now post covid now that well, everybody now, works yeah, everybody's working. It's, yeah. it's a whole different thing now. Charnay says, uh, I grew up in South Africa, and when I was 10, a well-meaning friend's mom told me I'd never be able to attend my dream school in America, and it'd be better to give up and not be disappointed. How many times have you had a well-meaning relative tell you that? Just don't don't try it, because you'll be disappointed. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, in my family, uh, I have 18 cousins, and there's two of us who are entrepreneurs. We do have some comments, he and I, about that, like... How, how did we end up being the only smart ones out of the deal? Isn't that funny? <laughs> not saying that if you're not an entrepreneur, you're not smart, but yeah, you know, yeah, right. You know well, I do like, um, who is that, uh, real estate guy? Grant Cardone. There's that. I was going to say, there's so many of them. Who's that real estate guru? You know, one of the 18 that, uh, try to get on our show every four hours. Well, if Grant Cardone tried to get you on our show, you'd take him. You'd take Grant Cardone just for entertainment. Actually, we could have Grant Cardone on the show. Grant Cardone would come on the show. Because you're like a big Grant Cardone fanboy. I'm a 10X dude. You're a fanboy. Yes. Oh, what the hell is that guy's name? Owen? Owen Wilson. Great actor. Really funny. Ah, I'm not coming up with it. But anyway, the guy's quote is, there's two doors in life. There's one that says freedom and there's one that says security. People that go through the security door get neither. Ooh. Oh, fighting words. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that's true, but I do like uh, Charnay's quote here. She loves a quote from NFL quarterback, Russell Wilson. Why not you? And she thought, why not me? Came to the United States. Uh, Vince is at joining the Navy. My dad's exact words were, why the hell would you do that? Boy. Nice. Wait a second. We to support the troops there, Dad. Yeah. You think Dad's probably not a member of Navy Federal? He wishes he was. And our friend Jason Vitug from Frugal uh, says, I was told that quitting my job to travel and leaving the workforce for a year was a big mistake and hard for me to come back, but realized after a year, I didn't want to come back. I think that's what it takes. OG, jump. Burn the bridges. Burn the boats. Yeah. Not bridges. Keep the bridges open, but the boats you can burn. <laughs> Jason is so inspirational. Uh, thanks to everybody for playing that game with us. If you'd like to comment on today's show, we're going to have a question about today's show and Matthew Pollard in our Facebook group, uh, the basement, stackybedjamins.com forward slash basement. Lastly, if you're somebody that needs help in your corner financially, you deserve it to have a good, knowledgeable friend. Take a look through your things and make sure you're on the right path to get on OG's team's schedule. Head to stackingbedjamins.com forward slash OG to see how their team can help your team be better with money in 2021. All right. That's going to do it for today. Doug, you got, you got it from here, man. After all the introverted stuff Doug did today, I can't wait to hear how we're ending this thing. What should we have learned today? So what should we have learned today? First, take a lesson from our headlines. Don't fall prey to sexy terms and strategies that might end up costing you much more than your potential savings. If things don't go right. Second, take a lesson from Matthew Pollard. 
networking, whether you're an introvert or extrovert, should be more about preparation and connection than sliming people with your verbal business card. Nobody likes a smooth-talking shark. But the big lesson... Make sure and read these scripts ahead of time and know your definitions, people. Luckily, we got it all worked out. And you should never extrapolate the. Wait, can I say that word? Oh, man. Steve, beep out that disgusting word. I think I've done enough damage. To learn more about Matthew Pollard, you can head to our show notes page or check out his new book, The Introvert's Edge, wherever fine books are sold or at matthewpollard.com. This show is created by Joe Saul Cihai, produced by Richie Rudder Reese, and engineered by the amazing Steve Stewart. Online, visit us on Twitter at S Benjamin's Cast or on our Facebook page. I'm Joe's mom's neighbor, Doug, and I'm pretty much the guy in charge of everything around here. Trust me, this well-oiled machine didn't get like this all by itself. SB Podcasts may receive payment on the show from sponsors and guests in the form of books, giveaway items, discounts, or other remunerations. That's a big word. There's no way you take advice from these dorks, but like Joe's mom always says, don't take advice from people you don't know. This show is for entertainment purposes only. And before making any financial decisions, consult with a real financial advisor. Many of you may not know that we are part of uh, the Westwood One network of shows. And part of the reason, oh, gee, I wanted to be affiliated with Westwood One is because, like you, I'm a big sports fan. Listen to sports a lot on Westwood One with my, with my dad. And while most of us watch the Super Bowl on TV, the action in many years is on Westwood One where Kevin Harlan calls the games. If you've never heard Kevin Harlan call football games, uh, he may be OG, if not my favorite announcer. Well, he definitely isn't my favorite because I know who my favorite is, but, but he's definitely in the top three. And uh, this year's Super Bowl, this year's Super Bowl was no exception. This happened, and here is Kevin Harlan's call. Second down, 20, 503 to go. Someone has run on the field. Some guy with a brawl. And now he's not being chased. He's running down the middle of the 40. Arms in the air and a victory salute. He's pulling down his pants. Put up your pants, my man. Pull up those pants. He's being chased to the 30. He breaks a tackle from a security guard. The 20, down the middle, the 10, the 5. He slides at the 1, and they converge on him at the goal line. Pull up your pants. Take off the bra and be a man. And the players with hands on Do you know the other half of that story that is uh, making the headlines? Lately, mm-hmm. although it may have been debunked by now, but the story going around on on the interwebs was that this dude had a parlay bet on would there be a streaker, and he decided to become one. And he was like, "It's the it's the third quarter. I got to get it done." And so the story goes. I don't know how true this is, but but the story goes: his buddy went first and drew the attention so that he could blitz down the middle of the field to make sure that it was, you know, broadcast basically. Kevin Harlan is just a treasure. Yeah, that is, that was a really good, he, know. he is so great. And the fact that we get to say that we're on the same network he's on just great for us. Uh, the second thing, a lot of you have, uh, if you're a super money nerd and spend a lot of time online, you may have seen this already, but if you missed Saturday night live a week ago, uh, you may have missed this great financial commercial. Are you- 
Are you bored? Looking for something to spice up your life? Oh, yeah. You used to want sex, but you're in your late 30s now. And sex isn't really doing it for me anymore. You need something new. Something exciting. I need a new fantasy. Then you need... Zilla. 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 We must as your sex now, and our listings are just standing by, waiting for you to browse them. An update colonial with mature landscaping. Unleash your passions. I want to flip that. And satisfy your bad fantasy. Mm, I'd never live in North Carolina, but if I did, I could buy a big, gross mansion. So what are you waiting for? Pick up your phone now. Open the app and tell us what you really want. Browse by yourself or go wild and invite your partner. The guest house has its own little kitchen. <laughs> the pleasure you once got from sex now comes from looking at other people's houses. <laughs> and don't worry, if you get too carried away with the fantasy, just click contact the listing agent for a rude awakening. Well, hello. Hi, this is Donna Lazzarini with Remax. <laughs> oh, hi. You're interested in 13 Call the Lane? No, I'm not. So when are you free? No, I can't no, do Sunday. No, never mind. I'm not actually looking to buy. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I think they nailed it. They're not wrong. I mean, I, I, do, I do find myself on Zillow going... <laughs> I would never live in South Carolina, but if I did, I would totally be on this lake. <laughs> this is this is my kind of lake in South Carolina. I would totally live in South. I, I would live in Charleston in a heartbeat. No, no, the one I was looking at was in the interior, so just this wonderful hill country area. So the next time, OG, that you're lonely and it's late at night, just open up Zillow. <laughs>